I promised you a good testimony today, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing it myself. John, come up and uh, tell us what's been happening, what the Lord's been doing in your life, and uh, how he's led you back to us. We're excited. John Horning. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, most people don't understand what it's like to do this. I mean, it's scary. You feel like you're in the twilight zone half the time. Um, and it's just a strange thing for God to reach down and touch you out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. I never thought about being a healer. I never thought about preaching <laughs> or talking in front of people. Mm -hmm. I never wanted to do any of that. I wanted to be an astronaut as a kid. That was about <laughs> it. Uh, but seven years ago, my wife and I had gone to bed, and, and she's a, a court, court reporter. So her hands were red on both sides. So I thought if I take my nice warm hand and put it on hers, it would make it feel better. So I did. I put it over there, and suddenly she goes, ouch. And uh, I, said, I said, what happened? She said, the pain's gone, look. And I looked at her hand, and her hand was perfectly fine. But mm. my knuckles hurt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding you. My knuckles hurt after that, but it went away after a few hours. So then uh, I ran into a couple of other people, uh, one person who had a bad leg, somebody like that, and I said, well, here, let me help you if I can. So I did it, and of course, their leg pain went away, and, my, and, and my knee hurt. <laughs> so I started asking pastors all over the place, Adventist pastors, you name it. I went to the Saddleback Church. I went all over the place asking, what's going on? What's happened to me, you know? <sighs> Believe me, I didn't want this. I mean, <laughs> to stand up here like this, I've got, you know, I'm nervous, as you can probably tell. Um, but God decided to use me as a vessel. At first, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know if I was supposed to touch the person. I didn't know if I was supposed to have my hands this far away. You don't know what goes through your head when you're doing this. All I know is every time someone asks God for help, God used me as a vessel to bring his healing power in through me into that person, and they got better. And don't worry, the people that had cancer and were healed, I never got the cancer, thank God. <laughs> Just the small things to kind of remind me how, how other people feel. I see pain in everyone. I go to a pain clinic because I fell about 10 feet when I was a school teacher and I broke my back and I've had six back surgeries. So I've lived for 24 years in terrible pain. And sometimes God doesn't heal people. I've asked him to heal me repeatedly, of course. <laughs> nope, nope, nope. He says, no, no, this is, this is, this is all for you. This is, this is yours, okay, mm. to bear. So there have been, out of all the people, and I can give you a list of them. Uh, there was a man in Colorado who was talking to me on the phone. Uh, he had prostate cancer. He had about three days to live. He said, I just want to live one month to see my grandniece born. That's it, just one month. So I said, Lord, I've never even tried this over the phone. You know, I don't know if you can do this, but <laughs> I prayed through the phone and said, Lord, please heal him. He was healed instantly. Praise God. And he lived for two months and then died of a heart attack. But he mm. got what he wanted. Mm. Another time I was riding along with someone who said that their daughter had a blood disorder and she had left her, lost her left eye because of it. She had cancer all over her face. So they asked me if I would go. And I thought to myself, Lord, I can't do this. And the Lord told me, he said, okay, I'm going to give you her name. And so he said her name's Kathleen. And I didn't know who this guy's daughter's name was. But I figured because they were of Spanish origin, their name couldn't possibly be Kathleen. But sure enough, it was Kathleen, which means I was supposed to go. And the Lord told me on the way, he said, now, John, you're not going to heal her of her blood disorder. And I said, what? <laughs> no, you're there for another reason. So I went there, and, and she's Catholic. And, and, and I don't care what you know, faith people have. I just, I'm just glad that they believe in God. So I went there, and she hated God. It was like it just steamed off of her body because she only had like a year to live, and her son was 16, and she wanted to have just a few more years with him. Mm -hmm. So she hated God. She told me, I hate that so-and-so because of what he's done to me. Look, I've lost my left eye. You know, what kind of a God does that? And so I told her, I said, you know, and she said, and I've never been to Mass, so I tried to explain to her that that doesn't matter to God. You know what God is? God is pure love. That's all God is. And he just wants you to love him. 
Mm. So after talking to her for about 45 minutes, she finally calmed down. And then I placed my hands on her. And she went to bed that night, and she wrote a letter to me, and she said that all the poison from her body just, just dripped out of her system. And when she got up the next day, she felt wonderful. Well, well, the seven tumors in her face had all disappeared. Wow. And she got another six years of life. And she was thankful to have six more years, even mm. though it didn't cure her blood disorder. I have no idea what God is going to do for you today. All I know is God heals people. Amen. And he heals everyone, even if you're not physically healed. He reaches down and touches you through your heart. I had a man who had pancreatic cancer. I, I talked to him. I, I prayed for him. But he was dying, and he knew it. And he said, what does God want of me? So I asked God. I said, God, what do you think of this guy? And God says, let me tell him this. Tell him I love him with the kind of love that a guy has for a girl when they're a teenager. And I thought, oh, that's kind of kind of <laughs> screwy, you know, a little weird. <laughs> but I did. It was a little embarrassing, but I told him that. And, and he didn't say much on the phone. He said, okay, hung up. And then after his, he died, his wife told me, he says, that was perfect, exactly what he wanted to hear. Because years ago, he had done some really dishonest things. And he didn't know if God loved him. Mm. And when he found out that God loved him with that kind of love, when you first look at someone and go, oh, wow, I love that person. I've got to have that person. That's how God felt about him, and he died peacefully. In fact, the last thing he said when he died was, I just want peace, and he died right there on the spot. Amen. So today, when you come back stairs and you need healing, God is going to heal each and every one of you. I don't know how. I don't know, I don't know what to, to, to what extent, but I know he's going to do that. Mm. Thank you for giving me the time Amen. up here. I'm exhausted already. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you. Amen. Well, the Lord does work in mysterious ways, and we can't figure out those ways. And uh, that's why we need faith. But uh, I'm excited about uh, what God does when we exercise faith. So I hope you're here to exercise faith today. Uh, we're going to be moving into a new series today. Actually, next week is going to be more kind of the traditional Thanksgiving sermon. If you're looking for that, uh, I like to run three series at the same time. So next week, we're going to go back to our Words of Encouragement, uh, Law of Attraction series. But today, we're starting a new one, which is really looking at the relationship between law and grace in the scriptures. And uh, once a month, we'll be exploring this topic, and uh, I've entitled it From uh, Lawless to Flawless today. But before we get into that, uh, I want to just have you think about helping a family. This is uh, Thanksgiving week, and we have one family that's really in need. They're going to be not have a place to live if we don't help them a bit today. So we will have a basket at the door as you leave today, and if the Lord uh, inspires you, they need about $300 to stay in their house. So anything above $300 will help go to the turkeys. We had 83 turkeys, uh, and uh, that's been a great blessing to see people here help with that so much. And so uh, we will take an offering at the door at the end of the service, so you can be praying about that if you want to help out with that special offering. But before we get into our topic today, I'd like us to just bow our heads in prayer. Father God, we thank you and praise you that uh, you are such a good, loving, merciful, caring God and that you give your good gifts to us all the time. So, so often we don't even recognize your blessings. But Lord, we know your greatest blessing is your son, his perfect finished work, what he's done for us and what that means and what it means in our relationship with you and our relationship with others. And we just pray that you'll press that home in our hearts and lives today because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The story is told of uh, an aggressive defense attorney who was used to getting criminals off from charges that they had to go to court over. And he was representing this man who was charged with a high-profile murder. And as he uh, spoke before the jury, he said, I hope you recognize that these charges are, are purely circumstantial. There is no hard evidence against my client. In fact, they haven't even found a body. In fact, I believe that this person isn't 
even dead. This alleged victim, I believe, is hiding and just wants to see my client die, go to the gas chamber when he's still alive. And as he got to his closing arguments, he looked at each one of those 12 jurors and he said, I want you to stare at those back doors because in the next 60 seconds, you're going to see this alleged victim walk through those doors. And as he continued his closing argument after 60 seconds, he said, this was a test, but I've noticed that every one of you have been staring at those doors. There's been a doubt in your mind. You've really wondered if that victim or alleged victim was going to walk through those doors, which tells me very clearly that there's a reasonable doubt in your mind, which may, means you cannot convict my client of this crime. Well, the jury went out after he made those closing remarks and came back quite rapidly. And uh, the, the attorney said, oh, that's a good sign. That's a good sign to his client. Uh, they made such a quick decision, it's obvious that they accepted my argument. But when the foreman handed the verdict to the judge, the judge read guilty on all charges. And the attorney was just beside himself. He ran up to the foreman and he said, how could you possibly come up with that kind of a verdict? I saw all 12 of your jurors staring at those back doors, believing it was possible that that alleged victim would walk through them. And the foreman nodded and said, you're right. Every one of us were staring, but we also noticed that your client never looked back. You know, there was no doubt in his mind about what had happened. The letter of the law can cut both ways. It can vindicate us or it can condemn us. And as we look at this series on how law and grace interface in scripture, I believe this topic is one of the most misunderstood in all of the Bible. I really believe that the great majority of Christians do not have a, a true healthy understanding of how law and grace interface in the Bible. And I want us to uh, think about that this morning as we look at three ways, the three principal ways that people relate to law in the Bible. Number one is lawlessness. Number two is being under law. And number three is transcending the law through the Spirit. And I want to make three points as we think about each of these this morning. Number one, there are three ways of relating to law. And generally speaking, lawlessness is the worst. I want to begin by us defining or attempting to define lawlessness, if you will. Now let's look over at 1 Timothy 1.9. Interesting verse here. It says, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers, etc. The law is not made for the righteous. It's made for who? The lawless. The law is made for the lawless. And what do we find here? We find that lawlessness is a synonym for what? Lawlessness is a synonym for ungodliness. It's a synonym for rebellion. It's a synonym for being profane, it says here in this verse. There, there's a similar verse over in Jeremiah 5.23. If you read from one of the Amplified versions, God says, this people are defiant. They are lawless. They are rebellious. They want nothing to do with me. Lawlessness tends to be identified with not even wanting to do right. Not only does a person do wrong, but they don't even have a desire to do right. That's kind of the essence of lawlessness. It's like the story of the criminal who spent many years in prison for a number of crimes, one of which was armed robbery, and the very first day he got out of that prison, he went to a friend who'd been an inmate, bought a gun from him on the black market, 
hopped on a bus, went directly to a small store, one person store, that he'd robbed before and uh, decided he was going to do it again, his very first day out of prison. And as he walked into this little store, the owner happened to be behind the counter, and he thought that he recognized this guy. So he watched him very closely through the mirrors up above. The man didn't realize he was being watched. And uh, he noticed the man went into his coat pocket, pulled it out, and there was nothing there. So he uh, walked over to one of the shelves, and he began unscrewing a large screw from one of these shelves with his fingernail. When he got this long screw out, he put the head of the screw into his coat pocket, and then he walked down the aisle towards the counter, and he said to the owner, he said, give me all your money right now, or I'm going to kill you. And the owner, who knew he had nothing but a screw in his pocket, just kind of laughed and said, you don't scare me. I'm not going to give you a thing. The man got really angry. He, he realized he'd been exposed somehow. He said, didn't you hear me? I'm telling you, this is a screw up. And the owner said, uh, don't you mean a hold up? The guy said, no, I mean a screw up. I forgot my gun in the bus. You know? <laughs> this guy was not only lawless, but he was stupid on top of it. And uh, that's the case with many criminals. But lawlessness is something that releases the wrath of God, we're told in Romans 1.18. It says the wrath of God is released on all ungodliness, on this lawless, rebellious kind of mentality. And people might say, but pastor, didn't Jesus take the wrath of God for us when he died on the cross? Didn't Jesus take all of God's wrath and satisfy God's wrath when he shed his blood for us? Well, it's interesting. I, I really encourage you to uh, take out a concordance, like Strong's concordance. It's analytical that contains every reference. And just look at the word wrath, particularly wrath of God, and see what it says. There's a ton about it, even in the New Testament, and it makes it very clear that the wrath of God is still very much around. There's still much of God's wrath to come. The book of Revelation talks about this a great deal. But thankfully for God's people, there are texts like Romans 5, 9 that says when we are in Christ, we are saved from the wrath to come. That's good news. We're saved from that wrath. We don't need to worry about that wrath. That when we accept what Jesus did for us, the wrath of God is out of the picture. It's no longer part of who we are to him. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, uh, that Jesus is the one who saves us from the wrath to come. So there's still wrath coming. The wrath of God is still going to be released against ungodliness, against lawlessness. Uh, the Bible makes that very clear. Um, and this wrath is focused on two groups of people, according to Scripture. It's focused on, one, the lawless, and it's focused on, two, those who are under law and think they are safe because they're under law. That's really interesting because most religious people are under law. We've talked about that before. Most religions are under law. That's how they operate. That's how they think. And for many, many years, I was under law myself. I have to admit that. That's how I was trained. That's how I was taught, that we're under the law. In fact, that we have the commandments that most churches don't. You know, we're, we're right. They're wrong. Um, you know, being under law is a good thing. That's how I was trained. That's how I was taught. But the more I studied the Bible the more I came to realize that this wasn't true, that this isn't God's desire for us. I became more and more concerned that being under law is not a good thing. It's not where God wants us to be. In fact, being under law 
is a synonym for being guilty. Being under law in the New Testament is a synonym for being condemned. The Bible says if we are under law, we are condemned. Being under law is a synonym for death. These are not good things. It can even be a synonym for lawlessness. In fact, you can't be lawless unless you're under law. The only way you can be guilty of lawlessness is if you're under law. We've talked about that before. Being under law can even be worse than lawlessness in the sense that most people who are lawless at least recognize they're messed up. They at least recognize they're screwed up. But people who are under law typically don't, like the Pharisees. They think they have it together, like the Laodicean church, like the group that Jesus talks about in Matthew 7, 22 and 23, who come to him and they say, Lord, Lord, look at all that we've done in your name. Miracles, amazing stuff, great works. What does Jesus say? I don't know you. Depart from me, you who are guilty of what? Lawlessness. I have the New King James Version here. I'm not sure what they're putting up here. But it looks like nothing. <laughs> the New King, uh, New, King, New King James Version says, you who are guilty of lawlessness. That's very interesting. Why would Jesus accuse these people of being guilty of lawlessness? Because they're under law. They're about performance. They're about what they've accomplished. Look at what we've done in your name, but look at what we've done. The kingdom of God is not about our works, Hebrews 4, 9, and 10. If we're in the kingdom, we have ceased from our works. We're not doing our works. We're not doing the works of the flesh. The only works we're doing are his works flowing through us. We are his workmanship created for good works in whom? in Christ Jesus. They're his works. They're his good works that flow through us. They're not our works. These people appeal to their works. So they're guilty of lawlessness. We look at 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. In the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves. All these terrible things it talks about. And then in verse 5, it says something very interesting. They will have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. Talking about professed religious people here. Talking about professed Christians. They'll have a form of godliness, but it's under law. They deny the power thereof. They're not walking in the power of the Spirit. They're walking under law. Point number two, if we are not in Christ and under his blood, we need to be under law. The law is not a bad thing for the lawless. That's who the law is for, the Bible says. Again, 1 Timothy 1.9. The law is for the lawless. And if we have the choice between being under law and lawless, and those are the only two choices, being under law is the much preferable choice for society. <laughs> if I'm going to have a neighbor who's either under law or lawless, I'm going to choose under law, you know. I don't care if they think they're better than I am, they're keeping the commandments and I'm not. I'd much rather have that than have them robbing and raping and killing in the neighborhood. You know, lawlessness is clearly worse in this sense than being under law. But we also mentioned that there's a, a sense in which being under law is worse than lawlessness if it produces self-righteousness, if, if it produces blindness to one's condition so that one can't be reached. The, one of the biggest purposes of law is to restrain lawless behavior, which is natural to human sinful, sinfulness. This is why Romans 7.7 7 tells us that evil behavior is defined and offset by the law. In the sense, in this sense, the law is holy, just, and good, Paul says. It's holy, just, and good because it calls us, it defines what is right, and it calls us to right behavior. Nothing wrong with the law. The law is holy, just, and good. The only problem with the law 
is for us as sinful human beings is that we can't keep it. That's the huge problem with the law is that we can't keep it. It's impossible for us to keep it. It's a standard that condemns us. So when we put ourselves under that standard, we put ourselves in the place of condemnation. This is why Romans 6.14 says what it says. Paul says, sin will not have dominion over you. Why? Because you're not under law, but under grace. That's a mouthful. Sin cannot have dominion over you when you're under grace. You're either under grace or you're under law. It can't be both. So many Christians think it's, you can have both. It's not true. The Bible doesn't give you the option of being under law and being under grace. It's one or the other. Sin will not have dominion over you if you're under grace. It will have dominion over you if you're under law. Sin will dominate you. It will have dominion over you if you're under law. That's what that verse is clearly telling us. So we don't want to be under law. And even a young child, even a baby, is born into this world sinful. That's what David says. In sin, I was conceived. I was born in iniquity. Even a little baby that we think of as innocent is really guilty under the law. Even a little child that seems so cute and innocent is guilty under the law. Reminds me of the story of the grandma and granddad who were driving along with their little granddaughter, Susie, in the car. And the grandma suddenly gave the old man a punch and she said, what's wrong with you? Look at that speedometer. You're 10 miles over the speed limit with our granddaughter riding here. What, what kind of an example are you to her? Now, she wasn't thinking about what example she was with nagging, but uh, anyway, uh, he quickly let off the accelerator and tried to keep it right at the speed limit and got home. And later that night, he had to run to the store for something, which was going to involve getting on the freeway again. And little Susie said, can I go with you, Grandpa? Can I go with you? Sure, sure. So he puts her in the front seat and takes off to the store and, she pokes him and she says, Grandpa, look at your speedometer. He was 10 miles over the speed limit again. Grandpa just kind of smiled, pulled the dollar bill out of his pocket. He said, Susie, we don't have to tell Grandma about this, right? And she took the dollar and then she put out the other hand. She said, Grandpa, it's going to cost you a lot more than that. <laughs> uh, inflation, a dollar just wasn't cutting it anymore. But... Uh, you know, the point of that story is that even very young, kids learn to be selfish, to choose selfishness over what is right. And we all have that problem as sinful human beings. The text that really changed me, and there, there are a number of them, but the first one, the, 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 the powerful passage that really made it clear to me that I could no longer teach and believe that I was under law was 2 Corinthians 3, 6 to 9. This is that famous verse where uh, Paul says, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And then he goes on in verse 7 and says, if the ministry of condemnation and death, he, verses 7 and 9, he, he calls the old covenant law the ministry of death and the ministry of condemnation. He says, even if those were glorious and that the Israelites couldn't look at Moses' face, how much more glorious is the ministry of righteousness, the new covenant, the covenant of grace, what God has accomplished through his blood? This other covenant is what? It is a ministry of condemnation and death. And he makes it very clear what that is. It's the Ten Commandments, not the ordinances, not, none of the stuff I'd been taught. No, this is the Ten Commandments engraved on stone by the finger of God. Paul makes it very clear. And he says it's a ministry of condemnation and death. That's what it is. If that's what you focus on, if that's what, how you define yourself, then you condemn yourself. You're under 
condemnation. Colossians 2, 13 to 15. Blotting out all the requirements that were against us. I was taught that was the ceremonial law. No. All the requirements that are against us. It's the whole law that condemns us. The ceremonial law doesn't even condemn us that much. It's the moral law that condemns us. Paul says blotting out <laughs> the whole law that was against us. He nailed it to his cross. He got rid of the whole thing. All the different aspects of law. The whole thing that condemns us. He took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And doing that, he did what? He disarmed principalities. I love that. He disarmed principalities. What does that mean? It means that the law is the weapon that the devil uses to condemn us. That's what the Bible tells us. The strength of the law is what? Sin. Sin. The devil uses condemnation and guilt when we're under law. And he uses it rightly. We have to agree with him. Because if we're under law, we put ourselves under a standard that we can't meet, that we are condemned under. And we have to agree with his condemnation. We have to agree with the guilt he heaps on us. We put ourselves in his ballpark, if you will. What the Bible says is that Jesus disarmed the devil at the cross. He took away the weapon that the devil uses against us. When we put ourselves under law, we rearm the devil. It's like handing him back a machine gun, handing him back all his weapons so he can condemn us, and we have to agree with him. That's some heavy stuff when you think about it. We don't battle against flesh and blood, Paul says, Ephesians 6.18. That includes our own flesh and blood. Our sinful nature dies when we come to Christ. Romans 6. It is crucified. It is no more. When we're in Christ, we are no longer under a sinful nature. That's what the Bible says, not me. That's what the Bible says. We're no longer under a sinful nature. We're no longer at war with ourselves. We're no longer spiritual schizophrenics. We're no longer people who have to condemn ourselves. We recognize the only true enemy are principalities and powers, spiritual darkness in high places. That's the true enemy. And that only weapon that enemy has left for kingdom people is lies. He doesn't have any power anymore. He doesn't have a law to condemn us anymore. The only power he can have is the power we give him. If we put ourselves under law, you know, what he does when a person's baptized, that's why I was so glad to hear you guys had a great week, because so often what the devil does when a person's baptized is he hits you with the big lie. You're no different. Your nature hasn't changed. You're the same person. You're still no good. That's what the enemy does. He's a liar. And so he wants to convince you that your sinful nature is still in charge even after you're baptized. But he's a liar. We know he's a liar. We know what he's saying isn't true. We know we're not under law. We know we're not under condemnation if we're in Christ, if we're under the blood, if we're under grace. Point number three. Being under grace is synonymous with being in Christ or being in under the law of the Spirit. That's very important. Being under the law of the Spirit. When I began preaching that we're not under law, there were certainly those who came to me and said, oh, you know, you're one of those now who says the law's been done away with and we can do whatever we want, you know, this kind of thing. It's just the opposite. It's just the opposite. Sin has dominion over you, when you're under law. Sin cannot have dominion over you when you're under grace, when you're in the Spirit. Romans 8, 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are what? In Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but in the Spirit. Being in the Spirit and in Christ are the same thing. Who are not under the law of sin and death, Romans 8, 2, 
but under what? The law of the spirit. The law of the spirit is the law of love. It is being spirit-led, it is being Christ-centered. It is moving in a relationship of friendship where we hear his voice and walk in the spirit as a result. That's the law of the spirit. It's very different than the old covenant law. It's very different than the letter that kills. The good news about the law of the spirit is that it frees us from condemnation. Being in Christ frees us from condemnation. And condemnation is really the deepest root that troubles human beings. That's why, even though I'm a psychologist, I consider psychology to be impotent compared to kingdom truth. Because psychology can never solve the deepest root problem. Psychology has no tools to free a person from condemnation. That can only be done through the blood of Christ. That can only be done by the one who died for us on the cross. That can only be done through the law of the Spirit, being in Christ, walking in the Spirit. He has freed us from the law of sin and death, and so we can have love, joy, peace, and freedom as we are Spirit-led. Now, I don't want to imply that's easy. It's not an easy thing. Even though Jesus says my yoke is easy, you know, there are times when the Spirit calls us to do things that aren't easy. Just in prayer meeting uh, Tuesday night, we were listening to Dennis Walker, and he's very worthy of listening to. We've listened to him a bunch, and uh, it's always profound and powerful what he has to say. But he was talking about how He had really been wronged by this one guy, just terribly. Gossip, lies, untruths, attacks, just some really gross stuff, you know. And he didn't like this guy very much and uh, because he'd done such terrible things to him. And the Spirit of God told him to go and apologize to this guy, you know. You go ask forgiveness of this guy. And Walker was beside himself, you know. If I ask forgiveness of this guy, he's going to justify everything he did to me and say yeah see you were wrong which is basically what the guy did when dennis went to him (laughs) he didn't he didn't repent himself he didn't confess he didn't ask forgiveness himself he basically just justified and uh, which is the very thing dennis had feared but god said hey i'm not worried about how he responds i'm worried about the anger and the hatred that was building up in your heart That's what you need to deal with. And I really took notes about that because I've had a couple times in my life where I've really felt that I was badly wronged by a small group of people. And I've had to really work to forgive, to try not to have anger or hatred about that. You know, and I'm just thankful the Lord hasn't made me go ask forgiveness. You know, (laughs) hope you're not listening, you know. (laughs) But uh, that would be very difficult for me to have to go ask forgiveness of these people for that very reason that I'd be afraid they would just use it to justify the lies and say oh see, yeah he even came and admitted he was wrong you know we're all we're all justified in what we've been saying and and so that that's a very difficult thing when God's spirit asks us to do these kinds of things but if we're obedient God will have something very good for us in it it will usually lead to a great breakthrough. And it's not our responsibility how other people respond. It's like the story of the woman who had her only child taken from her, from a criminal, who killed her only daughter, single mother. And it took her a long time to try to forgive this man. He was on death row for the murders he'd committed. And... Finally, the Spirit of God led her to go and ask this man for forgiveness before he was electrocuted in the electric chair. And, um, you know, she, she said, I want you to forgive me for the hatred that I've had for you all these years. And uh, the man didn't seem all that moved by it, but he said, well, thank you. And can I ask a favor of you? She said, sure. He said, would you please hold my hand during my execution? Uh, he, uh, 
he didn't seem to be uh, too moved by her, <laughs> her compassion and passion. And, you know, we, we can't control how other people respond or react. All we can try to do is hear what the Spirit is saying and to try to be obedient to what the Spirit is saying and leave the rest in God's hands. Again, 1 Timothy 1.9, the law is for the lawless. I hope none of us are lawless here because that means we're under law and that means the law is for us. But we're under grace. We're under the Spirit. We're in Christ. 1 John 4, 17. We can have boldness in the day of judgment. Why? Because as he is, so are we. When they call our names, who gets up? Jesus does. Jesus gets up in our place in the judgment when they call our names, if we're in Christ, if we're in the Spirit, if we're under his blood. As he is, so are we. There's no fear. It wipes out all fear. It says perfect love wipes out all fear. As God leads us into the law of love, the law of the Spirit, being in Christ, there is no fear. There's nothing to fear anymore. The person who fears is not walking in perfect love, John says. He's not walking under the law of love. He's not walking in the law of the Spirit. John 5, 24, Jesus says, You will not enter into judgment if you know me, if you are my friend, if you are my child. You will not enter into judgment. Even though 2 Corinthians 5.10 says everyone will be called before the judgment seat of Christ, Jesus is saying, guess what? When your name is called, I'm going to step there for you. You will not enter into judgment. Romans 5.13. Sin is not imputed to us when we are not under law. Sin is not imputed to us when we are not under law. Do you want to be under law this morning? <laughs> Sin is not imputed to you when you are not under law. This is the path from lawless to flawless.